Thank you very much, Dr. Gleave. So it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you all a little bit about the advances that we've seen in the past 20 years in functional neuroimaging and how that's really changed our appreciation for understanding crosstalk between the bladder and the brain, and also more recently pathophysiology of certain conditions like OAB and various forms of neurogenic bladder. Before we transition over to the talk, I'd just like to welcome and thank Dr. McEwen, who is a neurologist and professor of neurology at UBC, who's joining us today. And he's a local expert in functional MRI, and I'm so uh, happy and pleased that he's able to join us today um, for the talk. So let's move over to the next slide there. So with that, our objectives for today are first to discuss the advent of functional brain imaging and how this has changed our current models of bladder function with a direct focus on functional MRI. Once we go through some of the basics and foundations of functional MRI, I'd like to go into how these advancements have expanded our knowledge of the pathophysiology of lower urinary tract symptoms related specifically to OAB and a couple of examples of neurogenic bladder like spinal cord injury, MS, and Parkinson's disease. So our knowledge of bladder physiology is pretty much limited to this figure but in around the 1990s. Much of the work at the time was based on animal models and studying specific neurological lesions in humans. And through that, through those studies, we're able to get a fairly good understanding of receptor distributions within the bladder, the crosstalk between the autonomic nervous system and the voluntary nervous system. Um, and we're able to develop therapeutic targets to work on the bladder that we use day in, day out in urologic practice. The challenge at the time was understanding what happens at the level of the brain, because clearly there has to be some level of regulation at the level of the brain, uh, which you know we decide when to void, when to keep filling. With animal models and the technology at the time, there really wasn't much of a way to study this interaction. Even if you go back to literature in the 1990s, the seminal work that you see quoted was work done by Barrington in the 1920s. Um, Barrington was a urologist who wanted to try and get more information on this crosstalk between the bladder and the brain. And he focused on looking at the ponds. And he worked with several cats in his seminal work. He focused, he created focused lesions in various systematic lesions or regions in the ponds. And he studied these cats over weeks, basically kept them in his office and watched how they were voiding. He did autopsies on them after to see how much urine they were retaining. And he identified two distinct lesions within the ponds and created distinct types of voiding dysfunction if lesioned. He termed these the M and the L lesions. The M lesions would cause urinary retention if he caused lesions in the bilateral parts of the ponds. The L region created what he called a loss of consciousness uh, of wanting to void, meaning the cats would basically void whenever and wherever they wanted as opposed to going to the usual litter box area. So really after that work, our sense was that the pawns probably acts as a relay station for bladder afferent and efferent signaling, but what happens beyond that really was much of a mystery. This gap, is what functional neuroimaging, not just for urology, but for all fields of neurology wants to address. It is trying to use different imaging modalities to identify the areas of the brain that are activated during a particular stimulus or a task. Functional neuroimaging really started to take effect and take off in the 1990s. And it started to take off when neuroscientists started to realize a couple of principles with brain and neural activation. The first key principle was that when different regions of the brain become activated, they tend to or trigger a local increase in blood flow through cerebral autoregulation. So what would happen, say, in an area of the brain here that would be in the resting state, if you stimulate that area of the brain, there's going to be an increase in neural metabolism a corresponding increase in blood flow. And also, if we dive into this a little bit deeper, an increase 
and the proportion of oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin. The next principle that guides functional neuroimaging is that we need a way to detect these differences during a stimulus. And neuroscientists were able to come up with three modalities that are in use currently to pick up these differences. The first is PET imaging, where we give metabolic tracers that you know, get taken up preferentially by areas of the brain that are activated. The second is SPECT imaging, where you inject a tracer that distributes throughout uh, the normal blood volume of a patient. And then it would preferentially distribute into areas that uh, are drawing increased blood flow in the brain, presumably from activation. The third modality, which is the most commonly used now, is called functional MRI. And functional MRI we'll talk about in more detail, but essentially it rests on differences in magnetic properties between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin and uses that to pick up relative areas of activation. Functional neuroimaging in the urology space actually first came into light in 1996 when a Japanese group used SPECT imaging in 17 volunteer male medical students. And what this group did is they basically had these medical students lie supine in a SPECT scanner, and they injected tracer at the same time as when they were instructed to void supine in the scanner. And then they would obtain SPECT images to see which areas of the brain would be relatively activated. SPECT at the time was challenged by difficulties in temporal resolution and spatial resolution, especially when you're trying to nitpick you know, different areas of the brain. But what was very exciting with this study at the time, it was the first real window into understanding and seeing what's happening in the brain during urologic function. And if we go back to Barrington's work, what this Japanese group showed is while these healthy men were voiding, you saw strong activation within the pons, which is in line with Barrington's work. And you also saw activation in various areas of the cortex, which suggests that the cortex is likely integrating different signals in the environment and making that decision to initiate voiding through the pons as a very basic rudimentary model for voiding and voiding function. The challenge, as you alluded to with SPECT imaging, was that the ability of the scanner itself to isolate different areas of the brain was limited. And the other challenge was temporal resolution, because you're trying to capture very short-lived activations that probably last only you know, 10 to 20 seconds. And if you're trying to inject tracer and scan while a patient is voiding or experiencing urgency, it makes it quite challenging to be able to pick up those subtle differences. And this is where functional MRI uh, comes in and starts to address that gap. Functional MRI, again, was developed throughout the 1990s when a Japanese uh, physicist discovered an MRI sequence called bold imaging. And bold imaging is a technique that rests on oxygenated hemoglobin being relatively diamagnetic and exerting a relatively greater T2 signal than deoxygenated hemoglobin. Because this uses MRI, we see improved spatial resolution throughout the brain. And if we chart what happens throughout the brain activation um, in a functional MRI study, we see the bold signal rise throughout application of the stimulus and then die down once the brain stimulation or that activation is finished. The signal rises because you have a relative excess delivery of oxygenated hemoglobin translating to an increase in T2 signal. That's the major premise and basic foundations that underlies functional MRI. To give you a land or a basic road work of how functional MRI study would look like, you start with essentially two states you have an A state, which in this figure would be a resting state, and you'd have a stimulated state called B. The functional MRI scanner would be scanning at predetermined time points, and you'd be trying to capture this bold response um, as the stimulus is delivered. You average 
the signal increase or intensity over multiple repetitions. And then you subtract the average from your activated state from your resting state to generate a net activation map. This is the kind of figure that we'll see as we look into some of the urological literature. Before the one activation map is ready, a fair bit of data processing and analysis has to go into play for functional MRI. And I'll be honest that a lot of this is very complicated to me, but to give you some basics on what kind of processing would be involved, um, the people analyzing this data would have to adjust for motion artifacts, they'd have to adjust for noise throughout the cardiorespiratory cycle. And they have to transform the MRI images from the participants onto common standard atlases that are pre-established for the human brain so that we can make comparisons amongst different participants for common brain regions. Once the data is processed, a detailed analysis is then carried out for each voxel cluster and different regions of the brain are assigned different voxel coordinates. And then comparisons are carried out both between patients to see which areas are relatively activated and also between individual participants in a study. To give you a more simple, I guess, example of one of the early fMRI studies that were used to actually validate this technology um, was a study like this. And this is a study where researchers wanted to look at activation um, with a visual stimulus. The st off state was a dark room and the visual stimulus was a bright light. And we know from neurological lesions that the occipital lobe is involved in processing visual signals. So in this experiment, in the off state, you obtain a baseline image of your participant in a dark room. You then continue to scan once you've adjusted for baseline activation. And you see when the light is off, there's no real net activation. When you turn on a bright light, you see strong activation within the occipital lobe, um, as evidenced by this bold signal. And then when you turn it off, the signal goes away. This skeleton is a very similar approach to what we use to investigate fMRI in the urology setting when we design these sorts of experiments. To give you examples of what a usual experiment would look like in urology, you start with, see, participant, then you establish a resting state image, which say would be an empty bladder. You then have to decide upon a bladder stimulus or a task, which can be either direct or indirect. Most studies these days are using direct stimuli. When you look at a direct stimulus, this could be either bladder filling or voiding depending on which one you want to investigate. Filling can be either passive or active. Passive filling would mean you ask the participant to hydrate their bladders on their own and to fill the bladder by natural mechanisms, versus active would mean you're actually placing a urodynamics catheter and obtaining a concurrent urodynamic measurement throughout the study. Indirect, uh, to follow the other branch of this flow chart, is where you're trying to invoke a certain symptom like urinary urgency. And this can be done, for example, by showing the participant images that are known to bring out feelings of urgency, like say a toilet or a lock and a key. These are common things that we see in overactive bladder patients when they experience urinary urgency. You then capture the functional MRI image during delivery of the bladder stimulus and compare that to the resting state to generate your net activation map. With that framework in mind, I'd next like to go through some examples of studies that were done to look at bladder filling, urgency, and voiding in normal healthy subjects. This is an example of a study done in 2005 which wanted to look at areas of the brain that were activated in feelings of urgency. They took about 20 healthy females and they asked them to show up with healthy bladder, or sorry, with full bladders. They would then ask them while lying in the scanner to say when they felt urgency, and then they would scan the patient when they felt that feeling of urgency. Once the scan was done, they would terminate the feeling of urgency with a pelvic floor contraction. The authors then generated this net um, activation map. 
What this activation map showed is while these women experience urgency, you get activation in many different areas of the brain, which suggests that the processing of urgency is actually a very complicated uh, sensation and, a comp and involves complicated crosstalk between different areas. You see activation in multiple areas of the cortex. You see activation within the insula and you see activation throughout the brainstem, um, thalamus network, and also even the cerebellum. This is interesting because the function that of these areas is often involved in processing social cues, decision-making, and also emotions. Um, if we look at voiding next, um, this study again looked at women and filled their bladders with urodynamic catheters, and then asked them to void around the catheter. They then looked at which areas of the brain were relatively activated during the voiding phase. Here they show that there's relative activation within the insula and also regions of the prefrontal cortex and as well the periocto gray thalamus and pons network. These are again similar regions to what we saw in women experiencing urgency and again are regions that are involved in emotion, decision making and processing various stimuli and cues. These regions including the prefrontal cortex, insula, anterior cingulate cortex, and periocardial gray show up quite frequently in imaging, in these functional neuroimaging studies looking at bladder filling and voiding. And I think this makes functional sense or physiologic sense because what say the prefrontal cortex does is it's all involved in our decision-making, our social interactions, and processing our emotions. And it makes common sense to me that this would be involved in deciding whether or not it's a safe time or place for us to void. The anterior cingulate cortex and insula are also involved in emotions. And the periocoductal gray is a region um, that integrates these emotional inputs and adjusts autonomic and neuroendocrine outputs. In 2010, um, Fowler and Griffiths, who are one of the larger groups uh, around the world to study functional MRI, tried to put together um, a working model um, based off of all the different studies for functional MRI and PET and so forth. And in this model, they propose that in the bladder filling state, you have afferent signals coming from the spinal cord. It's originally coming from the bladder that then relays directly onto the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray will then relay these signals to the thalamus, which will then relay that over to different regions of the cortex, like the prefrontal cortex, oh, apologies there, prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate gyrus. Based on the prefrontal cortex and cingulate gyrus's interpretation of external signals and other factors at play, it will make a decision whether it's a safe time or appropriate time to void or whether the bladder should continue filling. And it will then say, if it's time to continue filling, we'll relay ongoing negative signaling onto the periaqueductal gray. This signaling will keep going until the bladder continues to fill. If the bladder fills to an appreciable degree, um, if, um, if the bladder signaling or if the brain's interpretation is that it's a safe time to initiate voiding, the prefrontal cortex will release that inhibition on the periaqueductal gray, which will then take off the tonic inhibition from the pontine micturition center, which will then initiate voiding. That is the essential working model that we have for normal bladder function. Uh, based off of integration of the data we have so far. With that working model, I next want to take you through some of the data that we have on functional MRI in um, patients with lower urinary tract symptoms and, lower, and neurogenic bladder. I'd like to start with overactive bladder because that's the best study area for functional neuroimaging. This work here by the same Griffiths group was one of the earlier studies 
looking at OAB patients. And they took um, and exclusively women, they had about 15 women and they stratified them based off on their bladder control from their initial symptoms and also uh, pre-study urodynamics. And they broke them up into good or poor bladder control. They then took them through a functional MRI study where they placed the urodynamics catheter and cycled the bladder at low volumes and high volumes and then obtained functional MRI imaging throughout. What was very interesting with this study is that if we first look at the patients with good bladder control, we see that at smaller volumes here compared to large bladder volumes, there really isn't much difference in the activation profile here. But if we look at those with poor bladder control, at the larger bladder volume, we see a much noisier fMRI signal profile. Um, and activation in multiple different areas of the brain. The next step in their analysis, which is also quite interesting, is they compared uh, net activation at large bladder volumes between patients with poor bladder control and those with good bladder control. And what they found is there was, interestingly, a relatively decreased activation in patients with OAB or poor control in a region that we talked about called the prefrontal cortex, which based off of studies in bladder physiology is very important in modulating um, urgency and when to initiate voiding. And we see this areas of decreased activation over in this figure, which is highlighted in blue, which is much of the prefrontal cortex. So a proposed mechanism then um, for suprapontine causes of overactive bladder based off of this work could be diminished activity in the prefrontal cortex, diminished inhibitory signaling onto the periodontal gray that would lead to feelings of urgency and urge urinary incontinence. In line with this study, um, more recent work has been looking at trying to see what ha happens in OAB when patients are um, undergo fMRI and are randomized to treatments that work um, versus placebo. And in this study, uh, the group took 20 women with OAB and randomized them to either daily tolteridine or placebo, and then did concurrent urodynamics and functional MRI. They then compared the activation um, at maximum desire um, in tolteridine compared to placebo. And they found a relative upregulation at the postcentral gyrus, which is a region of the cortex, suggesting that perhaps treatment of OAB may lead to upregulation of deficient areas of activation within the cortex and may help recover some of that inhibitory um, activation that may be lost in OAB. Um, what remains to be determined is whether anticholinergics or other treatments directed at the bladder have a direct um, central effect on the brain or whether this is just a response to their local effects on the bladder. Other studies as well that have looked at treatments in OAB like sacral neuromodulation uh, have shown similar increases in cortical activation in OAB patients who receive this sort of treatment, which is quite exciting. So with that, I'd like to move into data on spinal cord injuries. Now in the fMRI state uh, for spinal cord injuries, um, I came across only one study and this was a study which really wanted to see what brain activation looked like in fMRI in patients with complete Asia A spinal cord injuries. And they took various of these patients uh, with various levels of injury, but all were clinically Asia A incomplete and did concurrent urodynamic and functional MRI studies. What they found is when they looked at different areas of brain activity, interestingly during bladder filling, they found areas of activation in multiple areas in spinal cord injured patients in the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingular gyrus, and more. Um, this was unexpected in that we would expect that with a complete spinal cord injury, you probably would not see much brain activation on bladder filling, but we are seeing that in multiple patients, which suggests that perhaps maybe after spinal cord injury, there can be accessory pathways which are developed that provide sensation 
from the bladder up to the brain, perhaps through extra extra spinal cord autonomic fibers. But whether that's the case or not remains to be determined. Next disease state I'd like to transition to is Parkinson's. Um, and Parkinson's disease um, is a disease characterized by the death and dysfunction of dopaminergic neurons within the basal ganglia. This leads to a disturbance in the interaction between the basal ganglia nuclei and the remaining sensory systems and the brain cortex. This leads to autonomic dysregulation and also sensory misperception. Among the spectrum of Parkinson's disease, these patients can develop a very difficult to manage overactive bladder and urgency incontinence picture. To date, the studies looking at Parkinson's disease have been mostly PET imaging based. If we go through some of these studies, what the Parkinson's disease study showed is similar on a similar note to what Griffith's work showed in overactive bladder, Parkinson's patients compared to normal controls appear to have relatively decreased activation within the anterior cingulate gyrus and also the pons during bladder filling compared to normal patients. And one of the seminal works in this field actually compared Parkinson's patients not only just to controls, but also to patients who had deep brain stimulators and looked at what happened when the deep brain stimulator was activated versus not activated. Deep brain stimulators are usually implanted within the basal ganglia. What happened to these patients when the deep brain stimulator was activated, there was a relative recovery of that signal deficiency in the anterior cingulate gyrus. This suggests that perhaps a mechanism for lower urinary tract dysfunction in Parkinson's disease is deficient signaling or fine tuning of signaling um, from the thalamus um, to the anterior cingulate gyrus from dysfunction at the level of the basal ganglia that then leads to reduced inhibitory signaling on the voiding complex from the brain stem and periaqueductal gray. Furthermore, it also shows that deep brain stimulation uh, may also help mitigate some of the voiding symptoms in Parkinson's by helping to recover this pathway. The next and final um, disease state I wanted to go through is MS, or multiple sclerosis. And multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory demyelinating condition that's characterized by progressive weakness and also lower urinary tract dysfunction. Radiologically, MS patients have diffuse plaques that are located on MRI and often localized in various parts of the brain and spinal cord. And oftentimes from a urologic setting, you'll get these patients who have quite uh, severe urinary urgency, urgent continence, and sometimes even detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, depending on the location of um, these MS plaques. fMRI is the modality that we see most commonly uh, used to investigate um, MS for urinary tract dysfunction. This is a group in Texas that uh, examined MS patients um, while going concurrent to fMRI and urodynamics and compared them to healthy controls. And in this initial image, they're looking at um, strong desire to see which areas of the brain are activated. And again, a similar pattern to Parkinson's OEB. If we look, look at the net activation map, when the healthy, when the MS patients are subtracted from the healthy controls, we see actually diminished activity throughout multiple cortical regions or regions in the MS brain at maximum desire. Again, compatible with a similar mechanism of diminished inhibitory cortical feedback on the brain, brain stem and brain stem axis. The same group in the same paper also looked at voiding um, when the patients were asked to void around the urodynamics catheter and they picked up a similar 
um, similar pattern with diminished brain activity in the cortex in multiple locations compared to healthy controls. The last piece of data on MS I wanted to show you um, was data where um, investigators looked at the impact of intravesical Botox on brain activation pattern in MS patients. Um, this is a study where they took um, female MS patients, they obtained baseline uh, functional MRI, then administered intravesical Botox and it determined afterwards a post-treatment fMRI and urodynamics. And here, when they compared pre and post, they noticed increased um, brain activity in regions of the brain that we feel are important in cortical modulation of micturition, like the anterior cingulate gyrus, the prefrontal cortex, and the insula. The same common players that um, have been playing a role in multiple different disease states in lower inner tract dysfunction and neurogenic bladder. Um, this suggests that um, intravesical Botox may actually lead to some recovery of this in diminished inhibitory signaling as a hypothesis for how intravesical Botox may help um, MS at the suprapontine level. Um, whether that occurs by direct impact of Botox at the level of the brain or whether that's due to the brain responding to diminished um, activity or signaling at the level of the bladder remains to be determined. So with that survey of um, fMRI studies in various classes of lower inner tract dysfunction and neurogenic bladder, what can we take away from the overall message? I think the key message here is that fMRI really provided us with a window into different class or some of the abnormalities that may be occurring at the level of the brain in these various types of um, disease states. And consistent throughout studies, um, fMRI is able to detect altered supraspinal responses during filling and voiding in many of these different um, class of lower inner tract dysfunction. And that's common in almost all the studies that have been reported. Whether or not these alterations actually are driving the direct pathophysiology of the disease, I think remains to be determined. Um, remains to be determined whether this diminished, for example, diminished inhibitory cortical signaling is driving um, urinary urgency and urgency incontinence, or whether these changes are a response to changes that are occurring at the level of the bladder. I think that remains to be determined. But nevertheless, we are seeing a clear distinct activation pattern that's different in the disease state. And in certain classes of these diseases, are we seeing actual uh, shift towards a normal activation pattern with treatments that we know work in managing these conditions? I think overall is a very exciting um, finding and exciting next steps and better understanding um, these various classes of neurogenic and primary overactive bladder dysfunction. Before we conclude, I think it's also important to go through some of the technical challenges of functional MRI and um, some of the things that we should keep in mind as we interpret more and more literature that's becoming available in this domain. I think the first thing we need to remember is that functional MRI uh, rests on the assumption that changes in metabolic demands are directly correlated with neuronal activity. We also need to keep in mind that there is variability in how functional MRI studies can be carried out. And these are often different from study to study. And there's differences in you know, the specific bladder stimulus that's studied, how that bladder stimulus um, is evoked and potential differences in the types of magnets that are being used in these studies. 
And we need to keep that in mind as we make comparisons um, at different findings. Also, neural pathways that we've implicated in bladder function also are likely activated by other stimuli. And we have to be careful to control for these factors. Also, when we focus in on neurogenic bladder, um, we need to remember that there's quite significant variability in different neurological lesions. And there's a fair amount of variability in say one MS patient to the other. And making comparisons can be challenging um, between these different patients. But as we roll into the future, I think we're gonna see even further exciting changes in the domain of fMRI. We're gonna see shifts towards um, more standardized protocols for functional neuroimaging, not just in the urology space, but in all domains of neurology. I think we're gonna see increased sample sizes being applied to fMRI studies. And as we see the sample size increase and the number of studies become increased, we're going to capture the different phenotypes of lower urinary tract dysfunction and um, different patterns of brain activation in the different disease states. I think it's not unreasonable as well to start to see different thresholds for control patients and for different classes of lower urinary tract dysfunction. And we can start to see these sorts of thresholds or activation patterns perhaps to help guide ongoing treatment and to see which patients may, be, may benefit from perhaps bladder-directed therapy, maybe therapies directed towards the brain itself, whether that's pharmacotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And we can start to see how fMRI can drive those potential changes within the level of the bladder and also the brain. So with that, I'd like to conclude by saying functional neuroimaging, especially fMRI, has truly revolutionized our ability to capture, follow, and understand what is happening above the ponds during bladder filling and emptying. We've been able to characterize these pathways in normal patients quite well over the past two decades. And we've now been able to transition towards being able to better understand um, different abnormal bladder states, um, like overactive bladder and neurogenic bladder. And we know that there are alterations in this activation patterns between patients with disease and patients with healthy control and, and healthy controls. Furthermore, therapies that we use in managing these patients can lead to shifts in the fMRI pattern towards a more normal or a pattern that we see in control participants or patients. Nevertheless, I think we can expect to see a lot more exciting work in this domain to better um, characterize these different activation patterns and different phenotypes of lower inner tract dysfunction and to better guide therapy in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their time for joining us today. I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Stuthers for her mentorship throughout this uh, presentation and also to Dr. McEwen as well for all of his support and mentorship throughout this talk. So with that, I'll take any questions.